Kurt, good morning. Welcome to a nice chilly South California day. I mean, come on, man. It's nice. I, you know, I'll take this any day, yeah. but uh, nice to be here. Well, you've been back and forth to Houston and up in Connecticut. And uh, tell me about that with EndoQuest. Where are we right now? Uh, things are really coming together. You know, I think you know the team has been uh, really powerful. You know, we're really engaged. We started a facility up in Boston to do our manufacturing of our devices, our consumables. Uh, a team that I've known for 30 years, they, they have capabilities to make flexible devices, uh, which was a really hard find for us. Um, and, and, you know, Korea is, is as you know, is our, um, what I would call the heart of the company from a standpoint of software and systems and, and, and some of the device side. So we've been really blessed to have them come on board. We're hiring out there uh, significantly. We have a really good team there. We're expanding our uh, space there in Korea as well. And in Houston, we're, we're, we're running out of space, you know, so I was just there last week and, you know, we're looking to, you know, break into the next, uh, you know, next space and, and, and open up. But uh, all good. Really, I, I couldn't ask for better, honestly. So how would you describe EndoQuest platform to the audience that might not be familiar with it right now? Sure. So this has been a, a dream of mine, you know, a passion of mine for the last 20 years of the ability to do uh, scarless surgery. Um, scarless surgery to me or scar-free surgery is um, you know, doing surgery through existing lumens um, and this platform allows you to do um, that exactly um, and, and, and truly believe also that uh, the beginning will be slow but I truly believe that there will be no limitations of what we can do. Uh, and you know our focus right now is uh, transanal, uh, which has uh, been something that we've kind of been working on for the last five years, uh, four years. Uh, immediately after that, we're going to focus on transoral, uh, which is, which we think is the largest market uh, potential market and also the largest impact. Um, and then we're looking at a number of other areas where we think we can have a huge impact. Uh, the the good news for me is that the the transanal piece is pretty much locked and loaded, meaning we've done significant clinical cases outside the U.S. We, we know what it takes to get this done. So from a clinical standpoint, and, and we're ready to go. Um, and in the last two years, since I've joined the company, I've made the, I've made the platform more commercial ready. You and I talk about the difference between clinical ready versus commercial ready. So we really focused heavily on the, what I would call the, the commercial side and making sure that when the product is approved, that it's ready to you know, hit the ground running and be able to be commercialized. When you talk about uh, what, when it's ready to be approved, where do we sit right now, just roughly in regards to FDA pathway and potential commercial first in market? Sure. So uh, our hope is that, that we would file our ID. If this is a, um, a, a de novo 510K, as you know, so we hope to file our, our, our filing with the FDA this year, end of this year, sometime uh, fourth quarter of this year, uh, and start our clinical trial uh, first quarter of next year. Uh, we already identified our sites. Um, we, as a matter of fact, we're working with them. I, we've had multiple meetings with the sites. As you know, uh, clinical studies take a long time. Uh, you know, the three sites that we have chosen are power, powerhouses in, in the industry, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Mayo Clinic, and, and uh, uh, Brigham's part of the Harvard Center. So those, those takes, as you know, they take longer, uh, sure. the bigger the institutions, but they're really uh, excited about doing this for us, uh, with us. Uh, we, we had to turn down so many people that wanted to work with us. We, we, we really wanted to have the right partners to do the study because we want the study to be powerful. Uh, so we started that process going, and so um, I, I feel like we're on track. And the first indication that you're going to be going after? So it, it's, it's what, I, what I would say um, uh, small polyps up to seven centimeters, um, uh, about 17 uh, to 25 uh, centimeters up uh, from, the, uh, from the dentate line. So, you know, kind of a lower, lower, lower end of the, the colon, and then, and then eventually we'll go up uh, um, further. Uh, FDA, rightfully so, requested us to walk before we run, because originally we were just gonna go do the entire code. They said, look, you know, let's just do, you know, the easy path first, and, and, and so, so, uh, that's the, the approach that we're taking. Um, and the good news is, as you know, is once you get your first de novo 510K, your future pi uh, filings will be a 510K, maybe with clinicals, depending on what you're doing. So you become your own predicate device, which is really important. Why over the years has it been a challenge to put an endoluminal robot out? 
Oh, man. So you, I know you can answer that. Yeah. Now. Let me tell you, I have scars now <laughs> to prove. I think the two pieces are uh, cleanability and sterilization, steril mm -hmm. uh, the ability to sterilize. Uh, we've spent 18 months, the last 18 months, uh, mastering that. Uh, and then the second thing is ensuring that because our device is disposable, just like all the other uh, robotic platforms, there's really no business model if you're a disposable robot. It's just they're so expensive. So it's got to be something that's reusable, disposable, and the ability to get the same performance um, the first first time you use a product versus the 10th or 12th time you use it. Especially our de our device it goes through a very torturous path, and it's you know it's, it's got different angles, and you know you're putting a lot of stresses on the materials and, and the cables and, and the pulleys and motors. So we've come up with a and again genius way uh, to to prove out that we can do this over over and over again uh, up to 10 to 12 times. Mm. So those I would say the two two pieces that. Yeah, I lost a lot of sleep on, but I feel very good that we have it. Then, then obviously, the standing up a monster system. I mean, robots are difficult to make. I mean, there's 2,400 parts in a robot. So, you know, it's already a difficult thing to do. But those two pieces, I would say, is why nobody's, in my opinion, why nobody has come out with it. Um, so so that, that robot will have a reusable, reusable piece, um, and the sterilization was the real challenge there. Cleaning and sterilization, because yeah. first you got to clean it, and yeah. how do you get to those, you know, tiny little crevices, and how do you make sure that you know you got rid of everything first, and then you sterilize. Mm -hmm. And that, that when I was down in, uh, in the Quest facility last year, this time, I got to see that. And so you're actually building an entire sterilization system, independent of the robot. Yeah. So we decided that we got to prove it ourselves before we can expect the hospital systems to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, these things go down in the basement of a hospital and, you know, you pray and hope that, you know, they, they do the right thing. And so we wanted to make sure that we control that. So we have our own uh, cleaning system that we would give with every robot that um, has all, an ultrasound um, and, and allows, allows to ensure that, ensures that you, you can clean and uh, clean it first. And then the sterilization is really a standard cycle in every hospital. Mm -hmm. So they're really the two key uh, cycles that uh, uh, sterilization uh, cycles that are happening in most hospitals is uh, sterat, steris, and, and autoclave, and we're you know that's the two sterilization methodology that we're using. You and I, uh, so I, I want to applaud you as you continue to build out this team. You're not looking exclusively at people who will come to Houston. You're saying, get me the best athlete, and I'm not as concerned as where they live. Now, now that's a different school you and I grew up in. You and oh, I grew up especially in- Especially me, right? I know, yeah. So, so, and it's working really well for you. What, what have you thought about and had to adjust as a leader in that area? Yeah, that's an amazing, good question. You know, it, it's, it's who you know. So I, I give you an example, you know, a, a John Magnasco, you know, somebody that I've known for many years and, and I, I know how he works and I know how passionate he is. And, I say he's one of us. Like he, he, he built, you know, he knows how to get things done. I don't care if he lives. He's in California. Like you know, so you know. Uh, but you know, I, I cannot tell you how powerful he's been since he's joined the company. He's been to Korea twice already. You know, he's he comes, you know, flies to Boston and regularly. He's in Houston all the time. And then he's in, in California getting getting it done, because you know he's interacting with FDA. Yeah, he's trying. So to me, it's knowing the individual and trusting the individual that they belong and they fit in the team and, and, and they can get it done. Um, um, and you know, same thing with Perry Genoa. We brought him on and you know, he's a long time robotic guy. He's a not, I didn't know him, but I've worked really closely with him the first three months. Um, kind of partnership, because it was, you know, I'm, an, I'm a technical guy and you know, I don't want to give things away. And you know, it was, he made it so easy. He made it so easy for me to just say, oh man, you have it, you know, thank you. You know, and, and let's just, you know, let me know how I can help you. So it's, we talked about enabling, you know, it, our jobs as leaders is enable them to be successful. And, and sometimes it's letting go, you know, sometimes it's just saying, okay, you got it, I trust you. Um, everybody who's come on in the last three or four months have been powerhouses. I really believe that we have an amazing team, you know, um, you know from an operation standpoint, standpoint, I have two top, top guys who have been in the industry for 30 years um, doing this type of work. So. I, I sleep better at night, let me tell you that for sure. <laughs>
So that, 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 that allowed you to put people in Carolinas, California. I think we've got some in Boston, some in Connecticut, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. And uh, you've really built a really strong team there. And, and look, you've been super successful. You've got the early days of US Surge, you've got SurgeQuest, you've got Verb. So just for our viewers, what do you think about when, when you've made these decisions to build these companies and now with EnderQuest, what's top of mind for you on that one? Well, the, the last two were no-brainers. I mean, Verb was a dream job for anybody. I mean, you know, to be part of the future of robotics, that was just, and this is another dream job. This has been a dream of mine for 20 years to do, you know, truly, truly endoluminal surgery and scarless surgery. So, you know, for me, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed, you know, so I, maybe I'm, you know, I'm, I'm lucky, I'm blessed, whatever you want to call it, but this was one of those jobs, that, one of the jobs that I couldn't pass off, and, and I, I, I look forward to it. You know, I think, you know, you hear this more and more when people interview leaders and they say, oh, you, you, you know, you got to love the job and you got to, well, we all know that's not the truth all the time. But I, I could say I'm, I'm really blessed that the last two jobs have been blessed and, you know, really happy and enjoying it. Um, and, and having this power behind me from a, from a surgeon's, you know, you and I grew up, you know, partnering with them very early on and listening to them. And, and you know, I've had 49 surgeons visit my facility in the last six months, different specialties, different specialties, even areas where we're not even going into, thoracic, you know, and, and people come in and say, oh my God, if I had this capability in my space, I could do this. And then, you know, how does that not drive your energy level and, and, and your momentum? So that's really what gets me even more excited. I know where my focus is, but the fact that there's more to do and more to, you know, more capabilities uh, for us to be able to add value and make surgery better, I think that's, that's it. There's I nothing better it. than that. Love the excitement, my friend. Well, as always, appreciate Thank you, your sir. time. Thank first. you so much. Thanks. I'm Joe Mullings, SDTS and Sages. The next big thing, be well.